everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Gumis from Crowded Learning, and uh, this is the second in a series of, I have no idea how many, because we're just going to keep pumping them out, because uh, people are interested, and that's exciting, and learning about skill blocks and how to use it. But this is our second webinar uh, demonstrating sort of uses of skill blocks. We're going to go a little bit more in depth. Um, on your screen right now is a problem, and I'm putting it up for two reasons. Uh, over the course of today's webinar, we are actually going to create a skill block and organize the content within that skill block that uh, supports learners in uh, learning the concept of unit rates. Um, so last week, we just sort of introduced folks to the process of actually creating an account in skill blocks and searching for skills in skill blocks and, and a number of the other sort of tools that you need to get started. Today's webinar, we're going to be focusing specifically on organizing content um, and putting it together in one place. So that's, and, and also organizing in a manner that makes sense for students. Uh, so that's reason one I posted this problem. The other reason I posted this problem is as we are thinking, and I know everyone is in different sort of stages in terms of um, continuing learning for your learners and creating some sort of consistent pattern of how you are touching base with learners, how you are providing assignments to learners, uh, how you are even maybe even teaching in real time through something like Zoom, which we're using right now. But I wanted to uh, share this as just sort of, this is a type of problem that you could share with students at any time um, to do on their own, and then at some point in time schedule a call. Uh, or even a Zoom meeting with video where you can discuss a sort of more open-ended problem or a more in-depth problem like this to, to work through together and to provide you know, some instruction and, and connectivity, more, more importantly, as we're finding with Zoom. Um, I have now been to three Zoom cocktail parties and two, birth, two Zoom birthday parties. Um, so video conferencing has definitely become a tool that we are using to stay connected. So I, as, as we learn more about skill blocks, um, I am gonna be sharing more and more strategies for implementing it in ways that make sense and that are flexible depending on the way in which you are connecting with learners right now. And so that's why I posed this problem. Um, as I said, this webinar this afternoon, we're gonna be focusing on both exploring the content within skill blocks, so looking more in depth at the various resources that are included within the skill blocks library, and then how to organize that content within a skill block you created so that it is meaningful for you in terms of how you want to use it, and more importantly, if you're sharing skill blocks with your students in a way that can make sense for them as well. So before we dive in, um, I'm, I'm guessing I'm very tired of Zoom because I, I last yesterday I was on it for six straight hours uh, doing webinars and also uh, just listening in on one. But many of you are probably getting used to Zoom, but I know some of you may not have. So just a quick overview of Zoom as a tool in your Zoom window at the bottom. You have a number of different options down here in terms of your controls. Now, one thing to point out is this arrow for audio settings. This allows you to switch your audio at any time. And so sometimes when I'm listening in on a Zoom and I'm not running it, I will dial in um, because that's more convenient to me, particularly if I know I'm gonna have to get up at some point and leave the computer, I wanna be able to continue to be able to listen and participate um, if I don't happen to have the opportunity to be at my computer for the entirety of the time. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to mention. The other thing is, you know, one of the challenges that we are now facing as we are working entirely remotely is the fact that digital equity and um, access is obviously front and center, particularly in K-12 schools we're seeing it, but also obviously within adult learning. And so while not all of your learners may be able to launch a Zoom and because they either don't have a home uh, computer that is connected to the internet, or they're worried about that they, do, they could access the Zoom on their phone, but it's gonna use a lot of their data. Um, you can just run calls using a tool like Zoom and set up meetings and just say, hey, we're going to dial in. Um, then all that is is a phone call and you could still decide to run a video conference for those that can access and then be sort of mindful of the fact that maybe some of your, only some of your students 
are going to be able to see what you're talking about. But I wanted to point that out in terms of audio settings. In terms of what you have down here, <clears throat> uh, we have about 40 people here. So um, when I'm doing a larger webinar, I encourage people to use the Q&A because that way I get a log of all of the questions that have been asked and it allows me afterwards in case I'm not able to address them. Um, I'll be able to go back to them and see them. But for, for the purpose of today, I want you to feel free to use the chat window. Um, uh, and that's right here. So if I click on chat, uh, you're going to see that there's a log up top of all of the chats that have happened so far. So you probably only see, as far as I can tell, the one that I sent out at the beginning. Um, now, one person did provide their answer to that problem earlier, which I forgot to even give you the answer. Um, and I think that's because she only uh, sent that chat to just me. So the default right here, when you wanna click and type and send the chat out um, is set to all panelists. And so that's me, I'm the panelist and presenter on this webinar. If you want to send out a chat to everyone on this webinar, um, you would have to adjust and click on this arrow and select everyone. So um, that, that's what I've done here, and that's why this now says on my window, all panelists and attendees. I also have the ability, and you may as well, to individually um, chat with specific people uh, in the meeting. But you want to make sure this is set to everyone or all panelists and attendees um, so that everyone um, can see what we are chatting. Uh, the other thing that I wanted you to uh, to point out, excuse me, and I'm gonna exit out for a second here so that I can copy this link, is uh, there is a copy of this presentation that you can access simply by, and I'll put this in the chat as well, going to this link. This will open up uh, Google Drive and you will be able to open up this presentation, the, the, the Google Slides that I'm walking through in view only mode. So I encourage you to do so because while we'll be talking through all the steps and there will be a video recording of this webinar, uh, the slide deck will be helpful for you because we'll be walking through all of the specific uh, steps and you'll be able to go back to it and see it. So that link is available to you as well. So in terms of what we are going to do, and I see people popping into, that's what these icons mean, that people have jumped into uh, this slide deck by clicking on the link that I shared. <coughs> um, so what we're gonna cover today, uh, and again, if you missed last week's webinar, that's okay, there's a recording, but today we're going to just do a quick review of what Skillblocks is. And as I said earlier, we'll be doing a deeper dive into the various websites that are included within the Skillblocks database, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, and then we're going to look at actually go through the process of actually creating a skill block just so we can review that and then look at, okay, now I have this list of activities that I want to teach. How do I rearrange these activities in a way so that it might have a meaningful sort of sequence for learners if I wanted to share this skill block with my learners for them to work through um, if they're working on in the case that we'll be looking at unit rates. And then we'll briefly get into strategies for sharing skill blocks. Next week, we'll be having a series of webinars, um, sort of the same days, the same times, excuse me, Tuesday, Thursday, where we'll look specifically at um, different tools and different ways that you can share skill blocks through things like Remind and Google Classroom and Wakelet and other tools. Um, but we'll briefly touch upon that at the end of this webinar as well. So our upcoming webinar schedule, this is the last of the webinars on um, exploring and organizing content within Skillblocks. Next week, we have uh, two new webinars that will be Tuesday and Thursday that get dive deeper into strategies for sharing Skillblocks. So we'll, looking at the, we'll be looking at the different ways that you can actually take a Skillblock and either share individual activities with your learners through tools that you might already be using for sharing out assignments, uh, or share the entire skill block with learners to give them an option of resources, activities, lessons that they can work through on a particular concept that they're interested in learning. I can tell you the following week, um, we'll be diving even deeper into looking at, okay, now that we, we are using all these tools, how can you use skill blocks as a curriculum tool 
for uh, providing more blended learning options for students. And now right now that may not seem like it is necessary because there is no in-person face-to-face component that we're doing. The same things that we're doing online right now, many of them will translate in back into the classroom. And so as you even learn about skill blocks today, and in any other webinar that you're, you're sitting in on and learning about new technologies that you might not currently be familiar with, I encourage you to do so with a mind's eye towards, yes, this is something I am learning because I need it right now to serve my learners in this unusual situation we find ourselves, where we, everyone's learning at the same time because we're all learning new tools, but I'm also being asked to teach and my students are being asked to learn uh, in a remote setting, which is not necessarily comfortable for either of us. So I understand that you're, you're um, educating yourself on these tools to be able to provide something right now, but rather than just you know, take this as a, here are the band-aids to, to sort of um, tide me over until we get back to normal, I want you to think about how these tools can be used not just now, but how will that translate back into the classroom? Because the, more, the things that you are learning right now in terms of providing online learning and providing options for learners remotely is only gonna serve uh, both you and your learners better when you get back into the classroom because you'll be able to continue using some of these strategies to engage learners in learning, not just when they're in the four walls of your classroom. So I encourage you to do so. But next week, I encourage you to sign up for uh, one of the two webinars. These are the same um, on the SkillBlocks webpage. So as I did uh, earlier this week, um, you know, we're throwing, we're, we're, we're learning about all these resources, you're seeing all of these offers, you're, you're seeing all of this information flying around. But I want you to, uh, in the chat window, I would like you to go ahead and make sure again that it says to everyone or all panelists and attendees, just let me know or let your fellow colleagues know on this call, what are you doing right now at the moment to provide learning and support for your learners? So what communication tools are you using? Um, what online resources are you using? what learning management platforms or learning software are you using with students. I'd, I'd like to hear from you um, in terms of what you are currently doing right now. So if you could do that in the chat, please. <clears throat> we have a shy group today. Okay, some, uh, some folks are using a lot of Khan Academy. Uh, that's awesome because we'll be talking about uh, Khan, using Remind for communication, using Microsoft Teams, that's interesting, essential education, um, the TAPE and GED math instructional plans that they've had with Khan Academy links, that's awesome. So people are supplementing the things that they might already do with class and inserting the links. Lots of Khan Academy, so this will be very helpful, I hope for you. Um, Zoom and Skype, so some people are doing synchronous learning and WebEx. Um, great, thanks for sharing out to everybody, um, for those of you who are. Uh, so go ahead and scroll through because you might even see some ideas that you're interested in. Um, for students who do not have the internet, I'm having to use the phone conference calling to hold a session, um, which is great. Uh, someone's using ReadWorks, which is a great uh, free reading tool through Brightspace. That's interesting, which is a nice learning management platform. So great, it sounds like everyone's uh, using a combo of free resources and even paid resources and using some, some interesting um, different tools for, for sharing that with learners, great. So uh, we're gonna do a quick overview of what SkillBlocks is. And again, many of you may have attended last week's webinar and many of you may have not. So last week we did a, a very uh, sort of start to finish run through of how to create a skill block um, within the platform. And this recording is on our YouTube page. So Crowded Learning has a YouTube page. And this week I created a skill blocks playlist, which actually has this entire recording as well as the sequence that we sort of walked through in individual bite sized chunks that are three to five minutes each. Um, so I encourage you to go there. I will send that link in a follow-up um, to this webinar. Uh, but just some other resources that we have to support you. On the Crowded Learning page, um, we do have a Skill Blocks tab in our menu. And that is where you can go for any information that we're sharing about updates, 
um, webinars that we have upcoming, all of those links will be there as well as a link to our Skillblocks uh, YouTube playlist. So I encourage you to go there. Um, and then uh, we have also developed the YouTube video tutorials right here. And if you're actually in uh, this Google Slides deck right now, everything that I show is linked. Um, so you could actually check those out as I'm talking if, if, I, uh, if I bore you at any point in time. So uh, another chat and just more sharing. Uh, it's great. These are great tools. I'm glad that folks are utilizing them um, in this current situation. So in terms of what Skillblocks is, <clears throat> it's really just an experiment right now. Um, we at Crowded Learning are focused on finding ways to promote high quality free and open education resources and also to find ways to make it easier for teachers to integrate it into instruction. And so with skill blocks, it's sort of a next step for us in terms of rather than just saying, hey, here are great websites that you could go to, what if we pulled all of those websites into one place, as well as some of these publishing partners that we have and you see here, who have provided their alignments to the standards. And so instead of having to search all of these things for content related to what it is that you need to teach, we organize that all together in one place for you. So you can say, I want to teach this concept. What are the lessons and activities from all of these things that align to that concept? Um, and so that's in a nutshell what Skillblocks is. And the reason it makes it easier to integrate OER is we know that folks are used to sort of using these standalone curriculum products that have very consistent format. They have a very consistent lesson structure. They often have lots of support from the publishers who have created them. And so that's why we want to include those in here because we don't think it's a world where it's use only publisher resources or use only free resources. They all bring a lot of benefit to you and your learners. And so by pulling everything together, it makes it easier for you to maybe use publisher resources as I'm showing here as your anchor uh, in terms of these are the lessons that we want students to go through and sort of form the spine of our curriculum. But knowing that there is no one size fits all model for learning, here are other options that can provide additional practice, that can provide remediation or allow students to just go further with learning around the concept. Um, and so that's the goal of skill blocks. And a case in point is this is a lesson from one of our publishing partners, Paxson, in their Tape Tutor series. Uh, that focuses on this standard right here, which is a fourth grade level or TAB level M, CCRS level C standard on geometry. And it focuses on lines, line segments, rays, perpendicular lines, parallel lines, and the, the three types of angles uh, that are at least at this level, so acute, right, and obtuse. And so you see it, it does a very good job of walking through all these concepts and providing visuals in a very quick way and then has these practice problems. Now the standard itself says identify these things as one is doing in this lesson and draw. And there is no drawing activity in here. And so while this lesson absolutely aligns to that standard and it does a very good job of presenting the material, uh, it doesn't provide practice in drawing and students will, will need that if they're actually gonna have full coverage of the standard. And so, you know, if you go to skill blocks, you will see that that lesson is right here uh, because we have that alignment to that book. But then we have all of these additional uh, interactive tools and practice sets that allow students to work through concepts in different ways. And you'll see in particular in the Khan Academy uh, sets of activities, we have identify raised lines and line segments and then draw raised lines and line segments identify and draw parallel and perpendicular lines, identify angle types and draw angles, uh, right, acute and obtuse. And so it's providing that additional depth of coverage that's needed to fully cover the standards. Um, and the tools that we've included within skill blocks and which is particularly important right now because I know access is an issue and many of your learners may not have access to a uh, internet connected computer at home, all of the free resources that are in skill blocks are mobile friendly. So it, uh, it encourages students to be able to engage with math learning outside of class in ways that are more widely accessible than not. Um, we do know that a lot of tools are great for on a computer, but they're not necessarily operable um, on a mobile device. So in terms of what is in skill blocks, the goal of today is to look more in depth at each of these things. Um, these are the five resources 
that we have included in the skill-based database to start. And some things up front to talk about here. The reason we've included them is we know these are trusted. So Crowded Learning has not curated an individual activities in all of these because what we've done for the starting point here is pull together resources from sites that we know are either research-based or just highly used and effective in adult education and so there is a level of trust that's been established. All of the alignments that we have both from the publishers and from uh, these providers that you see on screen here are, are taken at face value based on, on the sources of the content. So um, all of these folks have provided their alignments to the standards and we are taking those at face value. You know, we will see down the road, <coughs> excuse me, um, if there's strategies that we can put in place for instructors or even students to provide us with feedback related to how well they think it actually covered the skill that they're looking at. But for, for right now, we are just looking at hey, here's all this content in one place. What are ways that you are interested in, in using this as a tool? Um, but amongst these five, there's 2,000 unique standards aligned free and open resources. So lessons and activities and videos and simulations and games. Um, and amongst those 2,000, they really, if you look at many of them are aligned to multiple standards. Uh, so there's nearly 5,000 different uh, references in terms of these resources and how they align two particular standards within the college and career readiness standards. Um, if you want to explore these resources on your own, um, you, like even outside of skill blocks, and just to sort of get a chance to look uh, at the resources a little bit more in depth, here is a link to a uh, wakelet that I created. I put this in the chat at the beginning, but I'm gonna put it in here as well. So this will open up a wakelet, and this is a wakelet, for those of you who don't know what that means, um, that I've created that is focused on skill blocks, but also focused on trainings that we do on blended learning in the math classroom. And so it has a link to skill blocks, and then it has uh, links to all of the different resources that are included within skill blocks, as you see here. And then additional free math tools, uh, which include video sites and lesson sites and free uh, math apps, uh, manipulatives um, and worksheets and other things that you can use um, to provide more practice and more in-depth instruction for your students. So that link that I put in the chat is to that wakelet. And I will also send that out after today's presentation. Getting back in, good chance to get water. So the first resource that we'll look at, and I think uh, based on what you put in the chat, most of you do not need an introduction to Khan Academy, um, but we have the alignments of all of their math practice sets uh, within Khan Academy. So as you know, Khan Academy is a full curriculum. It covers all levels of math. Um, they have video lessons and interactive practice sets for uh, each of these sets of content. Now, one of the things that you should know is with Khan Academy, uh, the thing that we have aligned within skill blocks is the practice set. So it's not like what you see here is that sort of starting point of a unit, I guess we would call it, of the lessons that you see on the left and then the associated practice that goes with it. As I said earlier, we have taken alignments at face value from the, um, the content providers. And so the only thing that Khan Academy provides in a easy to ingest format into skill blocks was their standards alignments to the practice sets. I've also found that it's kind of impossible to provide a direct link to the screen that you see here. And so I wanna point that out up front because it, it, it creates sort of um, a question of well, what, what would the strategy be for using Khan Academy practice sets in here. So um, to me, you could use these within a skill block and put them at the end because uh, you want students to just use those as their opportunity to assess and see if they know the concept. Um, or you could put them at the beginning of the skill block to see if this is a concept that they even need to work on. Um, so maybe you use these as pre-testing options and post-testing options um, to you know, allow students to work through content based on what they uh, already uh, know or don't know. Um, but that is what we've linked. And the notion here, and we've already also provided all of these alignments on the Crowded Learning website. So 
you may decide I don't want to use skill blocks, but all of the standards alignments documents that have gotten uploaded into skill blocks are on the crowded we're learning website and are available for you to make copies of. <laughs> but if I look here, um, you know, what happens from skill blocks is this is where a student uh, would be led to the practice set. And if you're familiar with Khan Academy at all, you know that for all of the uh, practice sets, there's this link that says, are you stuck? Watch a video or use a hint. And so that, when they click on it, will give them the opportunity to see the related instructional content to that problem so that, okay, if I can't do this problem, then maybe I should watch this video before I do this practice set. And then they also have the opportunity um, to get a hint. So this is part sort of a notion of maybe you use these practice sets as an opportunity for self-guided learning. Uh, the reason I'm excited to have Khan Academy in skill blocks is while I know it's very widely used, one of the things instructors have mentioned is a challenge using Khan Academy is students don't know where to go specifically within it. And I heard, I saw in the chat, one of the uh, folks on the call said that they've taken their existing curriculum and they've added Khan Academy links to the things that, um, to the associated lessons that are in their existing curriculum. I wish uh, I had given you skill blocks sooner because that would make that process far easier because you have the ability to search for the skills, find the resources that you want, and then uh, specifically see the URLs for those things as well. Um, the other thing about Khan Academy that I will mention is if you are using Khan Academy and you decide that you want folks to, students to actually launch Khan Academy by way of skill blocks, you'll need to make sure that when they get into Khan Academy that they are logged in if you're using Khan Academy's reporting um, and you've set up classes in Khan Academy. So if they're doing it from their phone and they have the mobile app on their phone, um, it will automatically open up the practice set in their app uh, under their account. Um, when you're back in the normal setting and maybe they're working on this in class on a computer that is not theirs, um, they will need to make sure that they, when they get to the practice set, log into Khan Academy so that that is actually being counted towards their account and that they're not just randomly doing the practice set um, not within their account and therefore not being tracked. Uh, I bring that up because that is one of the biggest questions that I've gotten over the past two weeks in talking about skill blocks and talking about any resource that we've been talking about at Crowded Learning. Uh, the big question of does it track time, does it track reporting? Uh, the first three resources that we look at, Khan Academy and now CK12 and the next one, they all do report uh, student progress within their platforms. So uh, CK12 is another one that's growing in popularity um, within adult ed. I'm not going to dive into it right now. We'll dive into it when we're actually in skill blocks. But it's a, I love this site because it basically pulls together various resources and various modalities that revolve around a particular topic. So this is the one on unit rates that we will add into our skill block that you'll see in a second. And so in this uh, CK12 resource set on unit rates, there's a reading there's a Plex, which is an interactivity that students can do and play with the concept. There's a video that's very much like Khan Academy. There's a practice set um, that has them answer questions about unit rates. And then there's also a real world example. So in this case, it's looking at discount clubs, which obviously the reason discount clubs are popular is you buy more and the cost per unit is less. And so it's, it gives them a real world example. And most of their uh, resource sets have all of these and more. And what you'll also see on a couple of these is these little bars that say there's two other videos, there's three more reads, there's one more interactivity that actually touch upon the concept of unit rates. Um, so I, I like this because it does kind of what Skillbox is doing with different websites, but it takes all of CK12's content and puts it together in one place. Um, one thing I'll note at the bottom here, just of interest for you, and Khan Academy had the same sort of uh, icon here, but it had an additional one. This indicates that the licensing of these resources. So Khan Academy and CK12 are both open education resources, meaning they have what's called Creative Commons licensing. And that licensing tells you specific things about what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do with it, which is really important uh, for crowded learning as we talk about, hey, these are free resources you can use. There are do's and do nots when it comes to that. And so that licensing lets you know that it's an open resource 
um, and allows you more flexibility in terms of how you use it. Uh, I will not be diving deeply into that during this session. Like literally, I have we've done an hour webinar in the past just on the difference between free resources and open resources. All but one of the resources within Skillblocks are openly licensed in some manner. So just so you know that. Um, also from CK12 are Flexbooks. <clears throat> and these are focused on middle school levels, which equates, and high school, excuse me, which equates to CCRS levels D and E or TABE levels D and A. So uh, high school equivalency levels. And so there's six Flexbooks that we have um, put into the uh, skill blocks, excuse me, library. So um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade equivalency math, so middle school math, and then algebra, geometry, and algebra two are also in there. Uh, what's really great about these is they are, they're highly interactive. Um, they have formative checks that, that are de delivered by way of these interactivities that students do and then answer questions throughout each lesson, which is super cool. Um, they have built-in Google Translate, so you can translate the content on each of the pages into multiple languages, and they're customizable. So if you create a, a CK12 account with Flexbooks, you have the ability to, um, to create your own books, pulling lessons from various things and even adding in your own content. Uh, and one thing to mention about Flexbooks and CK12, which was the slide beforehand, uh, while once, like a few times, you'll be able to click on links and maybe see the resource without having an account, eventually it's going to make you, uh, you need to have an account in CK12 in order to use those resource sets I just showed you and these Flexbooks. It's free, um, it is an entirely free tool, but just so you know that if you want students to be accessing these, both you and the students will need to have CK12 accounts. Um, and you can create classes in CK12, you, can, you have reporting in CK12, um, so it's definitely worth it to do so. Uh, it's just the difference is you actually can't see the content. Khan Academy, you do not need an account in order to be able to launch into Khan Academy. It doesn't require that learners to have an account. CK12, which includes Flexbooks, does. Now, with Flexbooks, as I said, this is one lesson and the lessons on ratios. Um, within CK12. And as I said, there's formative checks throughout. So right away, they have this interactivity where they're playing around and identifying what the ratio is of different sets of marbles, red to green, blue to green, red to blue. Um, then they're doing one and exploring unit rates and seeing how that looks like on a graph and then answering questions on that. Then they're exploring what are the words that are used that say rate um, on an activity here where they're dragging and dropping. And then they're doing a similar activity looking at miles per hour specifically. So there's chock full of interactivities within the lesson and they, they serve as really formative checks for the students as they're working through content. So I really like this resource. Uh, we are working with CK12 to hopefully do a webinar sometime in May or June. Everyone's a little busy right now uh, where they do a more in-depth interview of um, Flexbooks in particular. But what's nice about CK12 is what we've linked to is directly to each of these lessons and when the learner clicks on that in skill blocks they're going to be brought to a page that actually gives a description of what the lesson is about um, it provides other ways to learn much like the uh, the classic ck12 site provides um, where there's an interactivity and there's other ways that they can be learning this concept but this is a start to finish textbook that is online and interactive um, that again, you, we are linking directly to the specific lessons that align to skills, but also that you could, you know, you may decide, I just really like Flexbooks, that is going to be what I use as my core curriculum, and you can do so. So part of the goal of Skillblocks is to introduce you to resources that you might say, hey, I want to use this it more with my students and not just as a one-off. So um, an interesting resource. Another thing about Skill, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Flexbooks, is you have the ability to assign all the lessons to your class both uh, through CK12 if you choose to use their learning management system, but you can also choose to assign them through Google Classroom if that's a tool that you're using. Um, and you can set uh, start and end dates within CK12's learning management system. The other thing I wanted to mention is the big question is do these tools track time? CK12 does, excuse me, Flexbooks does track your time and students' time, excuse me in each of the lessons. Um, and it says where they are in terms of their exploration of the concept and, and, and whether or not they've, they've mastered the concept 
for each one of the lessons. So that's kind of a nice uh, feature that it has because I know that's important for folks in many states. <coughs> FET is an interactive website. Um, and so these get into more co uh, conceptual types of activities. And so I'll say that like, whereas the content we've been talking about up front, those are things that you would just assign students and they could work through on their own. FET is designed for students to do explorations, but I want you to understand sort of what it is and what it isn't. These are not lessons, these are simulations that are designed to prompt um, exploration of concepts. So you see a simulation here on the right that's focused on equality. Um, and in this case, what they're doing is just using objects. So the student at this point sees that two lemons is the same weight as three oranges and one apple. And so um, you could prompt them to say, you know, find equal amounts uh, on the scale and take a snapshot. And I want you to do that five times. And then I want you to just share what's your observation about uh, the weights and, and the, the relation between the different fruits in terms of their weights. Um, that's a perfectly acceptable way. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's completely open-ended. But say you are using WebEx right now or Zoom or Skype or some tool that allows you to share your screen. You could lead a class lesson using this simulation and say, get to this point where, okay, there's two lemons and that is equal to three oranges and one apple. What happens if I uh, add two more lemons? What is the weight? Uh, what am I going to need to do to the right? Can you figure that out how? So now you're getting into algebra, you're getting into equality and making sure that if you're doubling one side, you need to double the other side. And it's a way to have a real sort of focused discussion around a concept um, using a simulation that allows uh, for deeper sort of conceptual understanding. Um, all of the simulations have teacher guides that go with them. They're available in multiple languages. Uh, back when we get into the real world, maybe your center doesn't have good internet access or internet access at all. All of these are downloadable. You can download the FET simulations to your computer or your server. Um, and then there's also sample activities that other teachers have provided and you could provide if you create activities. So there's no, no shortage of tools that you could use to make these easy to implement with your students. Um, the other thing I like about the FET interactivities is like the concept of equality is something that spans all grade levels, right? So you'll see in many of them that there's multiple different simulations within whatever that concept is that gradually increase in terms of complexity based on learner levels. So I really uh, like that. So the last resource that we'll look at and then we'll dive into skill blocks is math is fun. So math is fun to me is like the Wikipedia of math. Uh, where it's very much sort of just, it's, it's sort of one pagers really of concepts that students can uh, learn, they're indexed, and then as they're learning a concept, say on, um, you know, adding fractions, you know, it says numerator and denominator, and it has links on numerator and denominator, because those are foundational concepts that the student might not know, and they can click on those links, and then they're gonna learn about numerator and denominator. So it's very sort of uh, linked, in terms of all of the concepts in math. It also has simulations, and the one that you're looking at right now is also looking at equality uh, in a different way, where they have to sort of add or subtract things, excuse me, to both sides to isolate the variable. So I like Math is Fun because it has a wide range of different tools. There's standalone lessons, there's lessons with videos, many of the lessons have practice sets at the end, there's games, there's simulations, there's even hands-on activities. Um, and it's easily indexed for you to find um, what you need. The other thing I really like about Math is Fun is that within the lessons, as I said, there'll be hyperlinks within the lesson on concepts in case, say, a student doesn't understand, doesn't remember or know what a numerator or denominator is. <clears throat> but at the end of these lessons, they also will sort of link to uh, this was one on comparison, but uh, a little higher level. So there's links to um, more foundational lessons on that concept, as well as ways to study more in depth on other concepts related to this lesson. And then there's question sets at the end um, that students can work through. So it's a wide range of content available to students in a number of different ways. And I also like their lessons because those questions um, provide feedback as they're working through the questions on every single answer. 
and then they get a report at the end that says how they've done. Some additional alignments on our website uh, that are not in skill blocks, but also I wanted to share this if you're, say you're also teaching reading. Um, we do have uh, standards alignments to Common Core Sheets, which is a website that has over 5,000 standards aligned worksheets that you can use with your students. Um, that are all aligned to the standards. So on the Crowded Learning website, if you go to the Skill Blocks page and scroll down, you'll see that there uh, are subject area icons. And that's where we have all of our alignments for all of the content, even the ones that I've shared above, um, for you to take and do whatever you want with. But we have standards alignments for Common Core Sheets. Math Antics is something we know lots of adult educators really like. They do not provide standards alignments. They explicitly actually say on their site that they do not have common core state alignments. Um, so getting to the point where we're in the process of trying to connect with them to ask if it's okay if we pull in subject matter experts to do alignments so that we can add their links into the skill blocks library. Because um, again, we're not playing the judge on you know what aligns and what doesn't. So we, we don't we never do that unless we're you know we're getting confirmation excuse me, from the site provider. The other thing, just in that, in that sort of fair use issue that I talked about earlier, you may have noticed on Math is Fun, it did not have a Creative Commons uh, icon, it had a copyright icon. So in that case, we reached out to Math is Fun to ask, is it okay if we link directly to your website in this way, this is how we're using it, and they were super responsive and very quick to say yes. Um, which is actually a good point because one of the questions that I got today from an educator was um, I'm interested uh, I have worksheets that it says I can photocopy and so I would do that in class but am I allowed to do that right now that were virtual if I was to say scan it and share a PDF and I encouraged her to contact the publisher directly to find out if that was something that was okay um, because obviously we're, we're in sort of a unique situation right now, and so maybe there's more lenience uh, that the publisher might have for sharing in that way, or even scanning it and sharing it on screen and working through it together. Um, on the right are uh, resources that, again, are on the Crowded Learning site where we've provided standards alignments um, to these leveled libraries as well. But just so you know what Common Core Sheets is, uh, there are, again, over 5,000 worksheets um, they do have some interactive practice in here. This is what that looks like. So we provide the name of, excuse me, the um, domain, the level for TABE and CCRS, the standard, the TABE emphasis, and then links to those worksheets. And when you click on any of these links, this is what you will see. There's 10 worksheets for every single uh, concept. Um, and then you can create custom sheets if you want. But then there are uh, interactive sets for many of them that are, you could share with students directly, as well as flashcards that um, are both interactive or you could download them to uh, print out and share. <coughs> All right, so finally, now we're gonna actually jump into skill blocks. So before we sort of do this, the question is how do you want to use skill blocks? So um, many people, so this is where I've created a bunch of different skill blocks around concepts I teach. And maybe I am just using this as a curriculum reference. So to the, uh, to the teacher that I mentioned earlier, who has said that they have their curriculum and they've gone and found the Khan Academy uh, resources that align to their existing curriculum, that might be how you are using skill blocks. It is just for your reference to find of all those, uh, those um, websites that I just shared, to find the resources within that align and then place it in whatever way that you're building out your own curriculum. But your students are never going to skill blocks. Um, you're never necessarily sharing out anything on skill blocks. You're simply finding the resources. Or you may decide that you want to pull everything together and create it in such a way and organize it so that you could literally share the code for the skill blocks with your uh, learner for that concept and then they could launch it from their mobile device or from their computer and then they can see other uh, resources that align and you'll see right here there's two publisher print resources that are up here obviously not necessarily relevant right now but in the future um, you might as well create these again with the mind's eye towards when we get back because that creates for you a learning plan that says hey these are the lessons in the books that i want you to work on and then here are additional resources that you can use for additional practice. Or you may decide that I use Google Classroom or I use some other tool 
and I simply want to copy a link from the skill, the skill block that I've created and uh, pass it out to my students through Remind or through Classroom or through whatever other tools that you are using to share out content. I just want to use that CK12 activity. I just want to use that Math is Fun activity. All of the online resources have this copy icon and when you click on it, it's going to copy the URL and allow you to paste it elsewhere. Um, so you need to think about that as you're creating skill blocks. And again, um, by doing this, I'd be able to share it out through tools like WhatsApp or Wakelet, like the Wakelet I created for you here, uh, Remind in Google Classroom, amongst others. So given that problem that I posted um, earlier, and again, the use case that I was sort of talking about is you might just pose a problem like this and say, I want you to, by the end of the week, solve this problem. Here's a skill block on unit rates, and you can work through these lessons and practice in order. And at the end of the week, we're gonna get together on a call, and I wanna talk about unit rates, what you learned, and then we're also gonna talk through this problem. Now, nobody, only one person attempted to answer this problem, but the answer is like, actually none of these is a deal. Um, and the reason I took pictures of these is because I saw uh, this one over here where it was, oh, it's 233 each and a bundle of 10 is only 2330. And I was like, wait, 233 times 10 is 2330. So how on earth are you saving anything? Because it's exactly the same price. You're just having me buy 10. And so then I did the math for every single other one and it was the same thing. None of these is a deal. I don't know why it says save whatever because you're paying the same per price per box in each of these bundles. So that was the trick, but this would be a great problem to have your students work on. And so uh, when you're pulling together your skill block, you need to think about sort of the various ways in which each of these things can be used. So CK12 and FET, those dive deeper into conceptual understanding. And then Khan Academy and CK12 both have video instruction that you might wanna have for students to actually sort of be walked through concepts. Um, Khan Academy has interactive and adaptive practice. CK12 has that as well. Math is Fun has practice sets. Flexbooks has practice sets. So, um, you know, you might, you wanna think about where's my instruction gonna be? Where's gonna be my concept exploration? Where's my practice going to be? And, and explore these sites to see which ones do that best for you based on how you wanna work with your students. And then again, obviously the tool that's not in skill blocks, but we have on our website, um, Common Core Sheets, this could be used for additional and offline practice as well. <clears throat> so when thinking about how students will use skill blocks, if you decide that you're going to create a skill blocks that you wanna be learner facing, once you do that, you get a code and with that code, you provide that to students and all they need to do is go to the Skillblocks webpage, uh, login page and enter that code. There are no student accounts and that's uh, intentional because right now we really just wanna see how instructors and how students are using Skillblocks. Um, so you can share that code with anyone that you possibly want. Uh, and then again, you could share out content using one of these tools. So I'm gonna go into Skillblocks right now and show you in like literally 10 minutes how I would create a skill block, how I would rearrange the content in a manner that makes sense, and how I could use it to explore each of the resources within. So skill blocks, the URL is skillblocks.org, um, and you will see that it'll jump to a different URL, and that's because I'm having some challenges with Google and migrating the domain, but that's on me. Um, but skillblocks.org will work, so uh, you want to keep that as your URL. And so I'm going to go to, ooh, I don't even know which account I want to use for this. Maybe two. Okay, yeah. So um, I've already created this, this skill block, but I'm going to create it again uh, just for the point, because I did share this with some folks and I didn't want to delete it because then they would lose access to it. But what you see here is I've created two skill blocks. Um, that have, in this case, 17 activities within and 11 activities within, and these are the respective codes. And that code is what the student would, would enter into uh, the login page to access the skill block. But what I'm going to do right in front of your eyes um, is create a skill block that uh, includes, um, that focuses on the concept of unit rates. Now, my students are TABE level M, which is CCRS level C. I've, I've said this earlier, not today, but in the earlier webinar. Um, we will have a TABE filter 
uh, once we have their final wording of the subskills, since they adjusted those for the reports, which will be nice because then with a student tape report, you'll be able to literally locate uh, the specific thing that it says a student needs to work on in here with a tape, if you filter by tape. But right now, this has all the domains of the standards across all levels. I'm gonna go to level C, which is tape level M, <coughs> and we're gonna focus on unit rates. So unit rates is part of ratios and proportional relationships. When I click on this, I am now gonna see all of the resources within the skill blocks library that align to the standards, and there's multiple standards in this substandard, or subdomain, excuse me, on um, ratios and rates. So I'm gonna scroll through here, and what I see is you see that there's two standards. There's RP1, which is the concept of ratio and use ratio language to describe it. So this is the more foundational concept. And then there's uh, RP2, which is looking at the concept of unit rates. Um, three, you know, ratio of three cups of flour to four cups of sugar, um, 75 cents for 50, or 75 dollars for 15 hamburgers. So this is looking more at unit rates. So I'm actually, I just want to focus, and I'm going to grab the ones that focus on six RP2. Now you'll see there's a lot of resources in here. There's 23 total. Um, and you'll also see at the bottom are these textbooks. Now, uh, these will not automatically appear for you in skill blocks. You have to actually add the resources that you have in your classroom, so the books, um, to your skill blocks library. And I'm not going to walk through that process today. I did in the earlier webinar. And there's also a video on our skill blocks playlist on how to do that. But I've added in multiple resources into my library here. And I see that th these specific resources or lessons in these two books align to um, this skill. So what's gonna, I'm gonna select those because those are the things that we always are using. And one of the things I wanted to point out is if maybe you are, aren't using all of these things, you can just click on up here and filter. So you'll see only the things from CK12, which includes Flexbooks um, align. So I am gonna grab um, uh, do, 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 equivalent ratios. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I'm gonna grab this uh, resource and, excuse me, no, we're gonna focus on unit rates. So unit rates, um, and then I see there is a Flexbooks lesson on unit rates, awesome. I'm gonna go back to all publishers just so I can go through this quickly. So I'm gonna focus again on the Khan Academy lessons that focus on this particular standard. So there's two here. And then I see there's two different um, activities in Math is Fun on rates uh, that have this standard. So I'll just grab that one. Uh, this is a lesson specifically on unit price. This is a game that is focused specifically on unit price. Uh, and then here is a FET simulation that is focused on unit price. So I've grabbed all those and selected them, and now I'm going to save it. So this, the second you've done that, you have saved the skill blocks. Now I still need to name it, um, and I still need to rearrange things, but you already have a code here um, that is going to allow you to share it with students. Now again, as I said, one of the things that you're gonna wanna do now that we're here is figure out, are these resources things that I want to use? So in this view, I have the ability then to click on all of these and see exactly what is it that I'm looking at. And this was the exact example that was on the slide for CK12 that had the reading, the interactivity, the video, the practice in the real world. So yes, I definitely want to use that. It's very comprehensive. You all know what Khan Academy looks like, but I'll just show you. So when I click on this, as I said earlier, it's going to launch me specifically into this practice set. Um, because I'm using my computer, it is going to log me into this as Jeff. So I don't have to worry about that, but that is going to be a thing again you'd want students to remember to do if they're um, launching from skill blocks. And then I'm going to see that this is a math is fun activity. Um, so this is actually a, a, well, this is like literally a hands-on activity, right? So, okay, maybe I don't want to use this. Um, so I'll either leave it in here or I could go back and remove it. Let me go back and remove it just so you see what that looks like. So I'm gonna drop that activity because I really, unless my students 
I don't know if people are like rationing uh, Rice Krispies, <laughs> um, but they probably don't have those things at home to actually do that activity. Um, let's look at the unit price game and see what that is. So this is a game where they are uh, working in here and it's not loading. Uh, let me reload it. And I'm running a lot of internet here. Oh, let me click a new game. Okay, so this is a little kind of advanced. So they're being told the amount in the, in the bottle and then what the price is and then they have to select. So this is like they're actually using division. So this might be something I want to maybe use at the end. I don't want to throw it up in front of them at the start as they're just learning the concept. Um, the FET unit rates activity is really good for this uh, standard. So when I go here, uh, this is what the student would see. They would launch FET and they would go to the shopping simulator here. And what they're doing is, is kind of cool. So they're seeing that um, five lemons is $1.25 and they're being asked over here, what is the price of one lemon? So they could, if they know how to calculate it, do that, or they could just drag these back and it's gonna tally and keep track of what the price of each thing is here. And we remove one more. And so now I see that it's uh, 25 cents per lemon. So I just type in here 25 cents and I'll get a check. Okay, now it's asking for the cost of 15 lemons. So again, a student might just decide, I'm just going to add more lemons and, and just get to that. Or maybe they understand that, okay, five times three is 15. So if I multiply this times three, it's going to be $3.75. So again, this could be used, excuse me, as a, a standalone resource that's just having students explore. And students could very easily explore this. That's kind of why it's designed this way. Uh, in advance, and then maybe you lead a class using it as the as the guide and walk through these things together. And what's nice is you can do it three times over with the uh, uh, apples and the lemons and the carrots and the potatoes. And then there's all sorts of different things that are going to have different um, different uh, levels of complexity. Even so, this gets into decimals as well. So I like this activity. I think I'm going to put it up front so it's like the first thing students see and they explore. Um, and then they walk through uh, some of these um, activities. And so this is the other lesson that we have in here. This is math is fun. And so this is a standard kind of presentation of content in a lesson format. Uh, you'll see it's linking to that game that's also in the skilled lock as well as um, questions that they can do uh, at the end to check their knowledge. So I've got all these things in here and now I've looked at them and again, I know they don't have access to the book, but I'm going to pretend that, you know, when we get back to normal, Tape Tutor is, uh, is, the, is my new product that I'm using, let's say. And then this new Reader's Press score boost for Tape is something we also have. So I'm going to put these up top. Um, but even before they're diving into a lesson, I want to uh, just drag. And the way I do that is I just click on the little hamburger menu here and drag it up to the top. So I want them to do this simulation, and then here's the, the books, and maybe because they don't have access to the books right now, I just click on this. So on their view, they will see that there's no star, which might be something that you used to say, these are required resources versus optional resources. <clears throat> um, I like this Flexbook lesson uh, because it's really in depth. We didn't look at it, um, but I showed you what those interactivities look like. And then I want them to have other options for learning here. And uh, this also is a lesson. So it's presentation of content from Math is Fun. So I want to put that up here. And maybe I use that as a more basic lesson because it is a bit more basic than the Flexbooks lesson. And then this is providing additional practice, uh, excuse me, instruction in that unit rates content set. And then uh, unit rates as a concept is gonna be the more foundational, then there's comparing rates, and then this is an optional game at the end. So now I have a skill blocks. Oh, and I forgot to name it. So I'll call it level M. I'll call it level C because I've already got one called level M unit rates. So now I've created a skill blocks. I've explored the content within the skill block to see if it's, if it's valuable to me. Um, and I've rearranged it in a manner that makes sense for how, if I was going to, maybe not unit rats, but unit rates. Let's go with that. Save. 
Um, I've put it in a order because I, as a teacher, am going to share this skill block with my students um, so that they have a sort of playlist of content um, in an order that they want. I could also segment it and have unit rates lessons and then unit rates practice and then unit rates games. Uh, and have those all be separate skill blocks. It's really up to you how you want to segment out this content, particularly if you're going to share the skill block directly with students. But if you're not going to do that, you now have a reference with all of your content in skill blocks that aligns to this particular thing so that when you're doing lessons in Google Classroom or whatever you use, you have access to all of these resources that align to that particular skill that you want to teach or you could copy paste these things uh, into tools such as these that allow you to share out your content. So um, one thing to note of if you're using a tool like Google Classroom, all of these resources, uh, if you're in them, they have a icon that allows you to assign directly from their website to Google Classroom. So you may just want to do that because it's, it's going to have that full integration. And again, that could be if you're using skill blocks as a guide. Um, and then again, if you're going to use tools like Remind to share out things, or uh, Facebook or WhatsApp, uh, or Google Classroom even, you can copy paste that link or that URL for any of those online resources and then paste it in and then send it out to students in whatever way makes sense for you. Um, and then again, if you want to use standalone lessons, um, and that's one thing that uh, I, I have done and we'll look more in depth next week is I will take, I've taken some of the things from skill blocks and created wakelet lessons um, where it allows me to actually put in prompts and directions for students and like, hey, start here, then work on these, and then complete these activities. So there's a variety of different ways that you could use skill blocks. The beauty of it though, is this allows you to pull all that content together in one place and make it easier, regardless of how it is that you wanna teach. Um, in terms of next steps, and I know we're a little bit over the hour, so I just want to finish up with this. Um, I do encourage you to experiment with skill blocks, try it out, and subscribe to the YouTube channel because all of the foundational things that I did not teach today, um, those are all in there in last week's webinar, which is an hour long, or uh, in the sort of playlist of step-by-step -step instructions, and those are all about three to five minute videos. Um, I encourage you to stay in touch through our newsletter. You can go to crowdedlearn.org uh, and go to the contact page, and that's how you sign up. And uh, after today's webinar, actually, and I've got a few more things to do, but I'll be sending a follow-up uh, to everyone uh, up to this point who has done a skill block webinar, um, because I am interested in getting your feedback, and, and there'll be a survey in there in terms of whether or not you've created accounts, uh, how are you using skill blocks? Are there codes that you've created that you're interested in sharing? Um, because I do want to also promote the notion that, uh, again, I'll talk about that teacher uh, who mentioned earlier that they, they basically took Khan Academy URLs and put them into their curriculum. You can segment out that work, right? Like you could have multiple teachers saying, I'm going to focus on unit rates. I'm going to focus on adding fractions and then share your codes with each other. And so you're not bearing the brunt of having to create all this curriculum yourself. Um, you can sort of tag team on it and crowdsource that effort so that in very short order, you now have a listing of codes of the different concepts that skill uh, students need to work on and have those available for teachers to use however they choose to want to use them, right? So um, there's a lot of flexibility in that. And we want to know if those are ways that you're using it because over time, if that's something that we see is common and people want to maybe be able to share that code and then make a copy of the skill block as an instructor, then those are things that will build in into updates of the platform. This is very bare bones right now for a reason because we couldn't invest too much to, to make it super robust, but I think it does a lot right now just as it is. So we really want to know how teachers are using it. So we'll be continuing to ask folks through surveys but then also um, in the follow-up, I am going to be starting to ask folks if they are interested in participating in pilots where we do sort of engage in direct contact with you and maybe even your students once we're sort of back in session um, to learn about how folks are using it. And, you know, if you are sharing them with students, what supports could we put in for students on the student side to make it easier for them to navigate skill blocks on their own? Um, the other thing that I'll just leave you with 
is uh, the EdTech Center at World Education has started a series of distance learning strategy sessions. The EdTech Center is awesome. They are the thought leader in distance education and blended learning in adult education. So uh, this website here, I encourage you to go and sign up. Uh, this is the third week that they've done it. Um, this week, they're actually focusing on some policy things, but also something called HyperDocs which is very relevant to skilled locks because HyperDocs is where you create a document that is a walkthrough of a lesson where maybe you have a Quizlet in there and you uh, have students uh, you know, uh, go to a Khan Academy lesson and you put it all in one place, which is sort of the notion of what one might do with skilled locks and the various resources. So I encourage you to check it out. Uh, if for nothing else, you'll get, get on their uh, newsletter and so you'll see the different topics that are talked about each week. Um, and there's different experts every single week. And then they have breakout rooms to focus more in intensely on the topic that you're interested in and, and, and discuss. Um, so that is it for webinar two. Thank you for taking an hour out of your day um, to learn more about skill blocks. And I, I am gonna stop, open it up to questions, although I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I do see questions in the chat. Uh, do we have access to the slides you're presenting? Yes. Um, I will share uh, out this, well, the, the slide, um, the link to the slides was, was in there, but I will send that out in the follow-up email that I send out tomorrow. Um, so yes, that will be coming to you. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for all you are continuing to do. Uh, both to learn yourselves in a very stressful situation that I know where there's tons of other priorities. Um, and more importantly, thank you for being there for your learners. Um, those are the people that we serve and it's great to know that they have dedicated educators um, who are there for them in a time that is of certain uncertainty for everyone involved. So I appreciate you and what you do and I hope that everything that we're doing is helpful. Thank you.